Hi everyone, welcome back to workshop and it's repair, modification and upgrade time today. I've managed to get my hands on a HP 3245A Universal Source. Now I do actually have one of these already and there it is there. But this unit I managed to pick up faulty. Now I did get it off of eBay and it was actually advertised as a working unit. However, when I looked at the actual photographs on the ad, there was an error on the display. It was actually powered up, but there was an error. So I actually contacted the seller and said, look, you're selling this as a, a working unit, but it's not. It's got an error, and I pointed out the error to them. And as a result of that, I managed to get quite a bit of discount, and here it is on the workbench for repair. PCBWay is your one-stop solution that's been expanded from their large variety of PCB prototyping solutions to 3D printing, CNC machine work and sheet metal fabrication. PCBWay also has a growing community on their site where it's become an open platform for makers to exchange and share their ideas, including the PCBWay store where some of the hottest modules can be purchased. I've been using PCB Way for years for my own products. Always reliable, always quality and always on time. So obviously we're going to fix that problem first, but then I've actually got some other plans for this 3245A. What I'd actually like to do is improve on it. Maybe make it a little bit more stable as a DC output for instance. But more of that later, let's get it powered up. Let's see what the error is and look a little bit deeper into that. Okay, I've set it for 240 volts. Let's power it up. Safe enough to do that, I think, because it was powered up in the ad. We'll give it a bash anyway. Test and RAM. Bad CMOS. Channel A only, that's fine. An error 201 PON. Okay, so the bad CMOS, that's bound to be a problem with the Dallas battery back rams that are fitted to these units. They do have a shelf life, the batteries eventually go flat with encapsulated ram uh, chips with the battery on the top. We'll take a look at that inside. The 201 pawn, that might be a result of the bad CMOS error but can also relate to the A5 outguard controller fault or the A6 outguard power supply fault. But I think first things first, well, let's open it up, let's take a look inside, let's take the top and the bottom cover off, let's just see what we've got and we'll take it from there. This case does have a few dings in the top, something's landing pretty heavily down on here and it's caught the front panel and the metal case and also at the back over there so we'll need to straighten them. Not too worried about the front panel though, I've got plans for that. Wow, and it's pretty clean inside. Let's get the bottom side off as well. And it's missing its feet on the underside, but I do have four of them as well. Well, this is the underside of the unit. Now there is some parts here I will be replacing. Starting off with the line filter. It's got a shaft and our line filter. I uh, will be changing out that. Right next to that there's a small reefer capacitor there. Not sure if that's an X-Class or what, but uh, I'll be changing that out. And there's a few electrolytic caps. Uh, I'm going to recap this power supply. And one thing I have noticed here. Let me see if I can position the unit. Let you have a look at this. So there's a couple of BNC connectors on the back of the unit there. And we've got some earth lugs on them and a couple of black wires but they're not soldered in place look at that it's just been curled round that uh, tab there and just sort of like pressed into place and there's another one at the back there and that's the same so that leads me to believe 
somebody has had this wiring out at some point perhaps to maybe remove one of the boards on the other side or something like that I'm not too sure yet but yeah they've just uh, temporarily just hooked them back round again uh, before they've actually gotten round to soldering them and this power supply is known as the A6 Outguard power supply board now there is an option on this unit that I don't have which obviously fits in here I don't have that it's for the high voltage board an A3 board a high voltage amplifier and it comes under option 002 turning it over this is the main A1 board the in-guard source PC assembly this is the main analog board basically that uh, takes its instructions obviously from the CPU board and outputs onto the front panel there are some components on here that I do want to change out. There are some electrolytic capacitors. I will be replacing them, recapping the board. And over here is the main VREF circuit, consisting of an LM399 and associated op amps, etc. And I do want to make some modifications over here. Hopefully to try to improve the 3245A. And here we have the A5 board, the outguard controller. This is the main processor board. You can see the EEPROMs, etc. on the board. And crucially, there's those two Dallas battery backed up RAMs, DS1235s. I will be changing out them. I'm actually going to do that right now before I actually tear this thing apart. I'd like to see if we could clear that error, or both of those errors, in fact, just by replacing these two Dallas RAMs. Now I'm not going to replace these battery back RAMs with uh, the same thing. These have a shelf life anything from 5 years to 20 years. It really does vary. And these ones are date stamped 1988. So they are pretty old and chances are they're flat and that's what's lost the settings that are stored in there. And perhaps causing those errors on the front panel. Now I'm not going to change them out for exactly the same types of units. I'm actually going to use a new technology or new to the 3245A anyway. I'm actually going to change them out for these. These are a couple of FRAM non-volatile RAMs but the good thing about these is there's no batteries, no external power supply at all required and luckily just by using a couple of SO to dip adapters you can basically create exactly the same footprint as the original Dallas Rams. So it's just a case really of unplugging those and plugging these in and then powering it up, clearing the errors on the display, turning it off, turning it on again and hopefully we shouldn't have any more errors. So we'll try that. But one small step before I do do that, I do want to power up and measure the 5 volt rail on the CPU board just to make sure it's okay in case we've got any kind of power supply problem. Okay, ready for the power up. And let's just check the 5 volt rail across one of these RAM ICs. 5.02 volts. Perfect. Now, as you'll notice, these RAM ICs are not in sockets. So we'll need to actually remove the CPU board and desolder them. So let's get on with that now. And check this out. I don't think I've ever seen GPIB connectors with rust free pillars you used to hold them in place must be something to do with the material they use on them they're always just dark brown and corrosion all over them so I'll give these a clean up at some point as well and there we go there's the A5 board removed and it's absolutely pristine perfect condition now before I actually remove these Dallas RAMs from the PCB, I'm actually going to mark them just so that I've got a note of which one was which. Ah, there's always one. 
the one where the ground plane's attached, I might have to just uh, pull that out manually. I think it's ready to drop. This first one anyway. And there we go. So I'll carry on with the next one. That's U121 and U122 removed quite successfully. So now I'll fit a couple of turn pinned IC sockets. And I'll just clean up the board. Okay, we're now ready for the Fram IC sockets are in place. I have actually already marked them U and L, that's upper and lower, because U121 is the lower bank and U122 is the upper bank. So let's put those in place. Perfect. And the other one. Nope. And that's the upper bank in place now. So let's fit it back into the chassis and see what happens. Not bother with the GPIB connector screws. Oh, I need, do need to clean them up. And there we go, ready for a power up. Now I just powered up a second ago, and you get the previous errors. Uh, so let's power up a second time. Yes, no errors. Let's take a look. No errors. So looks like we've cleared those two error codes that I got just by changing out the Dallas battery back rams. Now I would actually like to see if the new Fram ICs are actually remembering settings that I put in. And the easiest one to check is a GPIB address. So at the moment it is address 9. So let's change that. Uh... Address, and I'm going to change that to 11. And verify that. Yep, 11. So now let's switch it off. And wait a few seconds. And switch it on again. Yep, channel 11. The Fram ICs are working great. But the crucial thing is, will it actually output? Now, I believe it should still be calibrated, because as I understand, the calibration data is actually stored on an E-squared PROM on the A1 board. The Dallas RAMs I've just replaced are purely for all the settings. So, let's try an output. I've got my multimeter hooked up, so let's try... Well, I'll put it in a high resolution mode first. Should already be, but just to be on the safe side. And we'll go for one volt. <laughs> and yes, we've got one volt on the multimeter. Not a great test, it's just my BM786, but it should do the job for this initial testing. And we'll try 10 volts. And how about minus 10 volts? Yep, spot on. How about AC? Yep, 10 volts peak to peak, 3.53 RMS. Perfect. Looks like it's calibrated. However, I will actually calibrate it myself against my 3458 and get it matched up to my other 3245A how about testing some frequency outputs? So let me just set up the amplitude here and frequency 100. 
over in the scope there. 100 hertz. There is 100 kilohertz. That's working good. And the current output, well, I've just sent uh, 1 milliamp to it, and that's perfect. Ten milliamp. And one hundred milliamp. Perfect. Okay, so the next step is actually to recap all the boards inside the thirty two forty five A. However, I'm actually going to run some tests in advance of that whilst I'm waiting the capacitors arriving. And so I want to power the unit up and run some stability tests. So I need to pop the covers on and I do actually have a set of HP feet here that I've had in storage for quite a while so I'm going to fit them before I put the covers on. Now of course as I showed earlier the top of this unit does actually have some quite heavy dings on it as you can see here so I'm going to have to hammer them out before I fit it but I'll do that off camera. And here's the 3245A powered up. I've got it set to 1 volt output and I've got it hooked up to my 3458A which you can see over there and it's reading quite low actually so this unit is in dire need of calibration so I'm actually going to go ahead and do that now. Okay here we are inside WinGPIB ready to connect to both devices the 3458A and the 3245A over here channels 22 and 11 are already set all I need to do is connect to both devices so that's that done and now I'll pop over onto the 3245A calibration tab and here we are in the screen that will allow us to automatically calibrate the 3245A using the 3458A. Virtually no interactions required by the user. Just set up a few parameters here. The security code can be set here. 3245 is HP default. I verified that is the case with this particular unit. And a timeout set here, 15 seconds. And I've got A0 turned on. In this particular case, I'm only going to do DCV calibration. There's two auto calibrations available, DCV only and DCV and DCI. And that accounts for the full calibration of the 3245A. But we're just going to run with DCV. And what it'll do is, over here, it'll run through 47 uh, tests. It will send 47 different voltages, etc. to the 3458A, get the reading back and then make the necessary adjustments within the 3245A to set the calibration. There will be multiple reads on the 3458A, that's my own choice, and that was just to get as stable a reading as possible. So, we're all ready to go, let's just hit the button, and we're starting the tests. Setting up 3458A, I heard the relays click in the unit, and we're off and running. And you can see the 3245A is sending various voltages to the actual 3458A. So we'll just leave that run. It should take about 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And there we go, that's the last one just getting done now. Yep, we're completed. And we're now waiting for the 3245A. The procedure is the calibrating message is still on screen on the 3245A. So we just have to wait for that to time out and clear. And at that point, the calibration's saved. And there we go, you would have seen that happened off screen. And there we go, after a quick calibration there, you can see I've set the 3245A off screen to 1 volt DC output. And you can see on the 3458A, it's been recalibrated. Well, I've got a collection of electrolytic capacitors ready to go on and including the new mains filter. So let's strip it down and let's get soldering. So here we go, power supply board first. 
should be easy enough to remove. I'm going to have to remove it anyway uh, to get to the underside because I can't get to the solder joints from the underside. But also to get at the line filter in order to drill it out because it's not screwed in, it's riveted in. So let's get on with it. And there we go, that's the power supply board removed. And it's in pristine condition. So I've removed this electrolytic here, it's a 680 microfarad, 50 volt. A little bit of attention to detail, I am actually going to wipe down the top side of the board because there's a little ring right round where the capacitor was. Now it's probably dust, something like that, but I can't rule out that it might have been some slight leakage from one of these capacitors maybe. There's no visual signs of it on the capacitor, but certainly there's a little line there. It's maybe from the board when it got cleaned uh, during fabrication. But anyway, a little bit of IPA, can't go wrong. Just give it a little bit of a wipe down. Well, that's the board recap. Some nice new Nichicon capacitors, all fitted. So now we'll turn to the line filter. I'm gonna have to drill that out. Now the secret to removing these rivets here is to center punch them. Well, it looks like unfortunately I'm going to have to make a slight modification to my new line filter because the black surround here, which goes through the hole in the back of the unit, is actually very slightly wider than the original, which is actually quite skinny. And all the line filters I've seen have all got this nice thick uh, bulk plastic around the edges there. So, well, I think they're all the same from what I can see. So I'll just have to just shave a little bit off the edges there at far ends and that'll allow it to fit. Well, there it is, that's it cut down now. Not really happy that I'm fitting this one like it is, but I will keep my lookout for another one and I will replace it. Well, and from the back, it doesn't actually look too bad. And before I forget, we've got a couple of reefer caps. I'll change them out as well. well here's the two reefers that I've removed. And if you look closely, you can't actually see the case is cracked right along there. If I can get that in the right light, you can see that crack there. And the other one, it's not so bad, but you can see little striations through the plastic there, it's beginning to go. Well there we go, that's the power supply back in. One component I haven't changed out is this rather large 8300 microfarad 35 volt electrolytic here. I'm going to leave it, trouble finding one that value or thereabouts in that package, but it is a Sprag capacitor and they're quite renowned for being ultra reliable. So I'm just going to leave that one. And next to be removed is the A1 board, the analog board. As you can see, there's a number of large electrolytic capacitors. Now, I'll put my gloves on for this one. Don't want to contaminate the sensitive analog electronics. And whilst I'm there, I have actually got an extra modification I want to do whilst the board is out. So let's get this one removed and on the workbench. Right, I've replaced the electrolytics on the A1 analog board. That one, those two there, and that one there. And here's the VRF circuit roundabout here. There's the LM399 and the associated op amps are scattered far and wide really, including this rather special resistor package here. Looks like an IC, but I believe that's just a resistor package. I'm not going to touch that. What I'm actually going to modify is three of the op amps. I'm actually going to replace them. Okay, and here's the schematic for the VRF circuit here. I've slightly annotated it, so let's go through it. There's the LM399 there, the diode and the heater there, straight across an 18.5 volt supply, and you've got a non-inverting op-amp here. Now, fitted to the board is an OP07, but an LTC2057 is a much more modern op-amp, so I'm going to swap it out for that. This is a non-inverting op-amp on the negative side. There's that resistor array there. And your output from the op-amp is plus 11.6 volts. Slight amplification there over the 7 volt from the Zener. 
Now there is actually a positive feedback resistor as well and actually that's for setting the Zener current because with any Zener diode you require a resistor to set that current. So it's set at 1.2 milliamps. There is actually a resistor here which goes up to a 5 volt supply and that is actually a startup resistor. And what that's required for when you first switch on power, you don't necessarily have any output on this op-amp in order to set the Zener current in order for it to fire up. So this large resistor here, it's a 1.1K resistor, it's going to kickstart the Zener diode, give it a little bit of an output and that gets the op-amp up and running. Down on this side here you've got another OP07 and this is an inverting op-amp, again using that resistor array and that's to generate a minus 11.6 volts. The third op amp I want to change out is over here. We've got a low pass filter here and we've got a voltage follower and it's an LM358. Well, I can switch that out for an OPA2188. So that's the start of my modifications to this 3245A. Hopefully that'll make a little bit of a difference, perhaps make the VREF circuit a little bit more stable. From then on it goes into all sorts of relays and switching circuits and goes further into the circuit obviously for the DTA converter but I'm not going to go near that for the moment. I want to make these changes and then look to see if there's any performance advantage. So looking at the board there's the two OP07s and over here is the LM358. Now the ICs I want to replace them with are surface mount and of course these are dips so what am I going to do? Well I could actually use some of these SO to dip adapters but they are rather bulky. But the other problem with these ones that you can buy off of eBay is they're double sided. So you've got all sorts of legs going all over the place for the side of the board that they are not using. So I came up with my own adapter and there's one there and it's absolutely tiny. And I've made it with castellated holes around the edge of the board meaning that I don't actually need to put any pins down through the hole in order to secure it to the circuit board. I can just lay it in place on top of the actual location and solder it into place onto the top side pads of the circuit board. So I'll go away and assemble up three of these for the three that I'm going to replace and then we'll get them onto the board. Well there's the three op amps fitted and all cleaned up. Just got to fit it back into the chassis and give it a power up. One thing I haven't changed out and that is the actual voltage reference itself. It's an LM399. I could have changed that out for the newer ADR1399. However, I'd rather have the aged stability of the one that's fitted at the moment just to kick off. And if all goes well and the op amps are performing or making a difference, then I can change out that LM399 later on. Recalibration of course is not an issue because I can do it myself on my HP 3458A. Okay so let's power it up. No errors that's good so let's hook it up to the multimeter and let's output 1 volt DC Yep, and we've got 1 volt DC on the multimeter. I'd expect calibration to be maybe slightly out, but with the BM786 it's looking not too bad. Well, I think that'll do for a part 1 video. I have got some other plans for this 3245A, including replacing this front panel and hopefully fixing that VFD with the line right through the middle there that's totally blank. So thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does help the channel grow and if you want to help more directly then you can always donate via PayPal or Patreon in the links below. Plenty more repair videos on my channel. Check them out and thanks for watching.